I want to begin with a, a short anecdote, um, uh, something that uh, Amos Pizan, who's a scholar of um, modern uh, European Jewish history, works on Visa Chapters Judentums. He said at a, at, a con, at, a, at a paper that he gave at, a cat, at the Cat Center in, at the University of Pennsylvania uh, two years ago, three years ago, he said that he sees himself, as a, he sees that the, the role of scholarship is basically picking up a brick and throwing it through the biggest window he can find. And so for the next 15 or 20 minutes, uh, the brick is going to be the chazonish, and we are the window. Um, basically, basically what um, my interest in the chazonish started because of something that, because of his a small book, his anti musar book, um, Amun al that he wrote in 1953. For those of you who know the Chazanish, Avram Yishaya Karlitz was, was one of the great halachic authorities of the 20th century. He was the kind of titular head of the Bnei Brak community, arguably the kind of patriarch of modern Haredism. Um, and he offers a critique of Musar in this very small book that he actually uh, uh, directed his his students not to publish until after his death because he didn't want he didn't want it to be interpreted. He didn't not, not that he didn't want it to be interpreted to, to be an anti-Musar book, but I think he just didn't want to be alive when it was published because uh, because his stature would have given certain weight to the book that he preferred uh, was better published posthumously. But uh, the critique that he gives of Musar, and I want to define kind of Musar in a moment, but the critique that he gives of Musar is not really only a critique of Musar. It's just as much a critique of Hasidism. It's just as much a critique of Kabbalah. It's just as much, much a critique of Maimonidean rationalism. And it's just as much a critique of the brisk, Belushian, um Lithuanian uh, school of Talmud. In other words, basically, the Chazunish is offering a sweeping critique of orthodoxy as it existed in his time. And the position that he has is something that I call halachic totalism, which I'll explain in a moment. But the basic underlying critique is as follows. When we, meaning the Jewish we, uh, when one is engaged in a spiritual life where the subject or the I can determine or define truth, certainty, or divine will outside of the halachic orbit, this is already a secularizing project. And all of those groups that I mentioned before, Musar, Brisk Velazhin, Maimonides, Hasidism, are all in the Chazonish's mind are all guilty of this secularizing project. And the reason, uh, not the reason, but the danger of the study of Musar and Hasidism and Kabbalah and the study of Maimonides, even though they exist within the secular or within the halachic orbit, eventually, according to the Chazunish, will extend outside of it. Because once you give a certain autonomy to the eye outside of the halachic orbit, that will be the outcome, outgrowth. Now, in some way, what I'm, what, I, what I'm arguing in this paper, but th there's another paper that I want to refer to, read a few paragraphs, which is another paper on the Chazunish uh, called um, Chazunish's Emunah B'Tachon, Uncertainty and Doubt, Love of the Law, and Constructing the Halach itself, is that neo-Hasidism and what I'm going to be calling neo-Musar, which is a small but growing and interesting community of people in America Musar groups who are non-Orthodox Jews, who are basically adopting the Musar tradition to create a kind of uh, tikkun hamidot that is not necessarily in concert um, with the halakha, that neo-Hasidism and new Musar actually prove that the Chazonish was right. Now, we could see from our circle that um, neo-Musar or neo-Hasidism and I'll define neo Hasidism in a moment, are really mutations of the modern Muslim movement of Israel Salanter and his students, and the Hasidism, the Hasidic movement of the Baal Shem Tov and his students, that the neo-Hasidic movement or the neo-Musar movement are extensions, but, but according to the Chazonish, or according to the Chazonish's thinking, they are not only reasonable, but perhaps even necessary extensions 
of liberating the eye from the foundation uh, from the foundation of the halachic subject. So, what I want to do is first of all um, define um, what I mean by musar in the larger frame of pietism. I just want to read one short paragraph. By pietism, I mean literature whose focus is on the modes of behavior as opposed to, or in many cases, in addition to matters of belief or knowledge. Pietistic literature concerns itself with emotive states, love, equanimity, repose, patience, repentance, and anger, rather than knowing, believing in, or even in some cases, experiencing God. In many cases, both philosophers and Kabbalists wrote pietistic texts, but when doing so, their emphasis moved from the epistemological to the ethical. And in some way, we can say that philosophy, Kabbalah, the brisk method of study, and Musar are all meta-halachic enterprises. They do not deny halacha. Most of their proponents were strict halachists and even functions as legal decisors. Rather, largely by implication, all genres suggest that halacha alone cannot fulfill the Jewish devotional life which requires additional attention to matters of knowledge, belief in, or experience of God, or tikkun midot, the practical aspiration for human perfection that uh, philosophy, Kabbalah, or Masaka provide. The Chazunish will contest the very notion of the need for or viability of the meta-halachic enterprise writ large by positing a view of human nature and the law, arguing what I call a halachic totalism that halachic totalism is the exclusive way to assure the practitioner that he or she is not engaging in self-deception in the name of fidelity to tradition. Now, I, I want to say at the outset that, that he is not a classic misnagid. It's not a critique of Hasidism that you find among the early misnagdim. This is a, of a different order, because he was just as critical of the misnagdim, specifically those in Lithuania, as he was of the Hasidim, as he was. it's a different kind of critique. And I define halachic totalism as follows. Halachic totalism argues that as an agent, the I, the subject, is unable to free itself from its own evil inclination, enough to achieve any certainty. That is, it could never be certain that it has transcended self-interest. Reason is thus forever in a state of doubt. In fact, the eye for the Chazunish is in an incommensurable state of doubt, whereby all calculations are subject to error and uncertainty. Now, in a sense, all of these metahalachic cases are cases where there is an autonomous eye. Right? And it's interesting to think about the notion of bitul that we talked about earlier in Chabad, because the notion of bitul also assumes an autonomous eye that could then be mavatal itself. Right? So the notion of bitul does not get us away from the notion of the autonomous eye. Whether it is tikkun midot, whether it's deveikut, whether it's reason, it doesn't make a difference. Those things are all the same thing. Now, this is really all built on a certain kind of doctrine of original sin in the Chazunish. The Chazunish basically believes that as a result of the sin of Adam and Eve, the Yetzahara becomes so intertwined with the self that there's no way for the individual as an autonomous self to be able to know whether he or she is deceiving themselves even when they're, they claim to be aspiring toward holiness. So what's the solution for him? The solution for him is this: the use of this terminology. And it's a fab, fascinating term because he uses this term, ahavata halacha, the love of the law, love, loving the law. If you look. In all of these database searches, DBS, Bar Ilan, it's the only place in Jewish literature that this term is used. Nowhere else is the term ahavata halacha used. Anywhere. Now, I don't think he means loving the law. I think he means falling in love with the law. Right. Now, falling in love with the law for him becomes an, a, a kind of an act of eros and fidelity to the law, whereby the law itself prevents the autonomous eye 
from acting against self-interest. Because his position is that the halakha is actually against human nature. By definition, it's against human nature. It needs to be against human nature. And the beginning of the third part of Umunah B'Tachon, he goes through this long hakir, this long kind of discussion of uh, 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 Sugin Baba Batra about, um, uh, about teachers who come into a city where they're, in, where they're already teachers and there's this question of whether the new teachers are kind of taking over the territory of the old teachers. And there's a, there's a long sugi about what to do about this, right? Now he says, from any, the autonomous eye would say that you would side with the old teachers against the new teachers. These people have their situation. It's a question of hasagat kavul and halacha. And in a, in a way, the Talmud basically decides that, yes, the notion of hasagat agvul, the notion of you're not allowed to in, in, impede on somebody else's parnasa or territory, works except in the case of Talmud Torah. In the case of Talmud Torah, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not the situation. Thereby, in a sense, that he's saying that unless you have submitted to the halakha, you will act against it in this case because your natural human inclinations would say these people are being treated unfairly. Right? That's how he begins the discussion. So the, the, his notion is that, in a sense, you have to submit yourself by falling in love such that you are willing to become part of a system that is going to compel you to act against self-interest. Now, for him, this is not a kind of Leibovitchian notion of, of halakha. I think it really is much more of a notion of halakha that exists outside of the state of, of obligation. You're not, you're not fulfilling the law according to the Chazunish because you are obligated to do so. You are doing it because you have fallen in love with it. You have fallen in love with it such that you are willing to sacrifice your interest for that object. The other phrase that he uses um, very often is called diktu kadin, which is also almost never appears anywhere. Now, diktu kadin is a kind of, you can translate it as kind of exactitude in performance. Right? But it's more than that. I think that for the Chazunish, diktu kadin is an act of lovemaking, which speaks to this notion of khumra, a very, you know, Chazunish is very well known for his kind of stringent positions. But if you really love the law, according to him, you just want more law. You just want more. You can't get enough of it. That's the whole point. His critique of Mera Halakha, his critique of Chassidut, his critique of Musar, is that unless you actually are willing to submit the self, the autonomous self, through this act of love, you will always be engaged in pious activities where you will never know whether you are acting in self-interest or not. You will, you will then always be in this commensurate state of doubt. So in a sense, what the Chazunish is suggesting is the only way to live a truly pious life, from his perspective, is to, in, to engage in a particular activity whereby there is a dimension of certainty. And the only way you can have certainty is if you basically submit the self, because the self, as he says again, is inextricably tied with the evil inclination, you submit the self to a force outside of it that will direct you what to do. One of the fascinating things about him is, though, for, for, and this is where he's very different than Soloveitchik, and he's not a lachic man gone wild, in Larry's terminology, right? Because for, 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 because for, for the Chazunish, the halacha has no ontology. It's the opposite of halachic man, the way Soloveitchik paints him. In other words, it doesn't make a difference if in any kind of objective sense, the posek, the halachic decisor, decides right or wrong. It doesn't matter, right? Because the love act itself, is that, that becomes irrelevant. The objectivity, the ontology becomes irrelevant. So this is why he was so against the publication of Diktuke Sofrim back in the 20s, uh, where, uh, where you have this text which basically goes through Talmudic variants and shows it, it basically the emergence of critical Talmud study. And the Chazonish came out against it in favor of the Vilna Daf, not because the Vilna Daf was right, but because the Vilna Daf was what was. That becomes the object of love. So it doesn't matter. He, he en exits this whole, he takes halacha out of ontology and makes it actually a kind of love interest of the practitioner. Right? That becomes, for him, the only way that one is able to kind of overcome this sense of, um, uh, this sense of certainty. So 
In terms of the kind of neo-Musar and the neo-Hasidut, I think the Chazunish would say, he didn't know about it, right, because he died in 1953, but I think he would say, ah, you see, this is what Musar and Hasidut will bring. It will bring the autonomous eye to be able to construct a pious self outside the orbit of the law. Right? It's a natural outgrowth and not a mutation of Hasidut. And I want to actually make the, you know, I'll, I'll just kind of throw down the gauntlet here. I think one could make the argument that Chabad is the initial neo-Hasidut. Right? It's the initial modernization of Hasidism. Zalman Shakhtar Shalomi basically said that there were four turns in Hasidism. The Hasidim Rishonim, the early Hasidim of the Talmud, the Hasidim Ashkenaz, the kind of German pietists, the Hasidim of the Baal Shem Tov, and then his kind of neo-Hasidism. But of course, his neo-Hasidism, and he says so almost explicitly, is really an outgrowth of Chabad. And in letters between, that I've read between Zalman and Lubavitcher Rebbe, there's a, there's a real kind of argument where the Lubavitcher Rebbe is telling him, you're doing this wrong, you're doing this wrong. And he's just saying, I'm just following you. Right? This is the natural extension. And if the Chazonish would have written the, re, read those letters, the Chazonish would have said, yes, you're right. That's what happens. You can't prevent that. You can't prevent, once you have an autonomous self that acknowledges the possibility of a relationship to God outside of the halakhic orbit, you cannot prevent the exit of the halakhic orbit as part of that process. I'll stop you.